I ran 320 watts of electricity through some bread dough, and I stumbled onto something big. In my quest for crustless bread, I uncovered a superior baking technology used only by bread scientists and huge factories making panko breadcrumbs. And a safe, easy way you can make crustless bread at home. Let's start at the beginning. Panko breadcrumbs are by far the best breadcrumbs for creating a light, crispy breading around fried food. They're so good because they aren't baked in an oven. They are baked by running electricity straight through the bread dough. This bakes bread so evenly, it does not form a crust, leaving the bread free to expand without being caged in by a crust, creating light, flaky, porous breadcrumbs that get crispier and let the oil drain out after frying. Fluffy, light, and crustless bread sounds perfect for a PB&J sandwich, but you can't buy this bread in stores. Supposedly, because it is so light and fluffy, it is too easy to squish. Even if you accept that this bread is too fluffy to safely deliver to a grocery store, why aren't local bakeries baking bread this way? Well, it turns out this practice used to be more common in the past. In the 1940s, multiple Japanese magazines published DIY instructions for making these ovens at home. So why aren't they still around? That seems to be sort of lost to history as far as I can tell. So let's make it and figure out why. So to cook bread this way, first, we have to understand how it works. At first, I was wondering, does electricity cause some kind of chemical change in the bread causing it to cook without ever even heating up? But no, I was totally wrong. When a current faces resistance, the electricity pushing its way through a resistor creates heat just like how rubbing your hands against each other does. This is how electric ovens work. But with electric ovens, the electricity goes through a metal heating element. This heats up the heating element, which heats up the oven, and then we put the bread in the oven to heat that up. But this heats the outside of the bread way more quickly than the inside, which is of course why we get crust. And while I love a crust on a good sourdough, Sometimes you want a good old-fashioned crustless PB&J. And how do you do that without throwing crust away? What if, instead of using electricity to heat up a heating element, we use electricity to heat up the dough directly? This is way more efficient, since we're only heating up the dough. And since electricity is flowing through every part of the dough, the inside and outside of the bread heat up at almost exactly the same rate. Meaning, it cooks way faster, more consistently, without crust, and fluffier. Before we make it, you definitely should not try electrocuting bread at home. People often think 120 volts is not dangerous, but that's only because it will not injure you. It either won't cause you harm, or it will kill you. This is because it takes 100 milliamps through your skin to cause burns, but only 50 milliamps through your heart to cause cardiac arrest and end your life. Stay tuned, and I'll teach you a safe and easy way you can make crustless bread at home without building any death traps. Let's make the bread electrocuter! The first step is taking this cord, chopping off the end, and stripping it. So I have an adapter I can use to take power from my source to my conductive plates. I laser cut some plywood into rectangles used to hold everything together. In an enclosed space in a room temperature room, a one inch square bar of aluminum that can safely reach 90 degrees Celsius can carry 545 amps. Heavy duty aluminum foil is eight ten thousandths of an inch thick. So a one inch wide strip of aluminum foil can carry a little under half of an amp of electricity. According to scientific papers, this setup should pull around two amps. So I will use a six inch strip of three layers of aluminum foil just to give myself plenty of wiggle room. The concern here is that as a conductor resists electricity, it generates heat. But as metal heats up, it resists electricity even more, which generates more heat, 
and so on until you have an electrical fire. We don't want that. So we roll out our aluminum foil onto our plywood and go totally overkill splicing it to the wire. While I used the National Electrical Code to make sure my math was in the right ballpark, this device violates the NEC in more ways than Chris Bowden violates the English language. Leave a comment with your favorite way this device violates your local fire code. Thanks to my generous patrons, I was able to buy this AC motor controller that I am using to control the voltage. Thank you to Ari, Ray, and YouTube confuses and frightens me. Please don't credit me there. I hope I got that right. If you're curious, I'm making progress on my mechanical marble computer. The next step is going to require 31 of these 3D printed parts. So I decided I'd do this while I waited for stuff to print. Let's get to the most important part of this assembly, the dough. So we're starting with a French bread recipe since it's easy and delicious. Mix yeast with sugar water, let it foam up, sift your flour for fluffiness, add salt for flavor, dump in your yeast water, mix into a shaggy dough, and knead if you want to. Then just let it proof. Wood is a pretty good electrical insulator and it's what the fancy Ponco factories use to separate the conductive plates and contain the dough. So I will too. I hold it all together with clamps and drop in the dough. Okay, and we're turning it up. I instantly crank the AC motor controller up to its max, around 116 volts. Volts measure how hard the electricity is pushed through the system. And the yellow meter is showing how much electricity is moving through the dough. It's showing amps, so if you want a more useful unit, Multiply that number by 6.24 quintillion. That's how many electrons flow through the bread every second. Well, it's AC, so the electrons are just moving back and forth, but you get the idea. The current totally dies pretty quickly. I think since too small a part of the dough was touching one of the plates. That small connecting dough stopped conducting electricity once it cooked and left the rest of the dough raw. To solve this, I'm going to take out a spacer so much more of the dough is up against the conductive plates. And here's where Ohm's Law can really mess with you. Because you would think that if you cut the distance in half, you cut the resistance in half. You double the current, and therefore you double the power. But you are also giving the electricity twice the cross-section to travel through which halves the resistance and doubles current again, quadrupling the power. This is why it's so handy to have my voltage controller. I plugged in, but off, getting ready to turn on. All hands clear. <laughs> we look so cool. <laughs> Super protected. Milo, what are you doing? I'm the safety crew to prevent fires. Okay, now that we're safe and we have fresh dough in, let's cook for real. Okay, well, it had a lot of super hard parts, so I think I overcooked it. It has a nice yeasty nuttiness like you would expect from a French bread, but there was also some suspiciously metallic colored spots all over it. When I was first looking at it, I had no idea what was going on here, but then I looked back at the footage. Those bright spots are electrical arcing, like really, really small bolts of lightning. So loud buzzing, bad. Arcing, bad. The arcing vaporizes aluminum foil and then deposits vaporized aluminum condensate on my bread. That's also bad. Now, I hope these arcs are caused by the wrinkles in the aluminum foil. 
arcs are far more likely to happen at sharp corners than flat surfaces. So getting a flatter conductive plate would be an easy solution. So aluminum foil is out. It was a weird idea. I don't know why I started with that. I do have two aluminum cookie sheets. These should be stronger, thicker, and way flatter, which should solve all our problems. The professional way to splice a wire to a cookie sheet would be to drill a hole in the cookie sheet and bolt it on. But I don't want to drill holes through my only two cookie sheets, so I'm doing the second most professional way of splicing wire to cookie sheets, which is duct taping exposed wires to cookie sheets. Don't try this at home. I keep telling you. I'm using more dough so I can distance the spacers again. And between that and using the cookie sheets, this is now totally quiet. It's a little tricky to see when it's done since there's no crust and you definitely don't want to stick a fork in this. But the nice thing is, once the top is done, the rest is done. So I just turn off the electricity and feel it to make sure it's not still dough. I switch to a fluffy sandwich bread recipe, and now the fluffiness is really coming through. Now that we have our setup and process dialed in, this is ridiculously easy. It's faster than baking, and that's before we even consider you don't have to preheat an oven, and you don't have to use oven mitts. You just put the bread in, turn it on, and wait. That's it. Oh, also don't touch it and die. So why don't we see this everywhere? Well, it is used one place outside of making breadcrumbs. Food scientists have been using this method to bake bread for decades to study exactly the process in which bread gets baked. It makes a lot of sense. The bread cooks almost perfectly evenly, and you get a really precise control about how much heat you are adding to the bread. This way, scientists can eliminate many variables and also manipulate the variable of heat very precisely. And when we control our variables like that, we can get a much clearer view of what's happening inside of bread. Having tried this bread, I think it's pretty easy to see why it hasn't caught on. And I think many of you have been yelling it at your screens already. Without crust, bread tastes super bland. And I'm not even just talking about enjoying the flavor of the crust. The crust is caramelized bread. And when the dough is encased in a cage of caramelized bread, and those steam and the flavors are permeating through all of the dough, that makes the rest of the dough taste way better. The French bread I made, I let it proof extra long, and that gave it a nice nuttiness from the yeast, but there was still something missing. And the sandwich bread I made was probably the most flavorless bread I've ever tasted. And that's part of why this technique works so well for panko. After the bread is dried and made into crumbs, it's toasted, which adds back some of that great flavor. Another issue with this bread is that because it's so fluffy and porous, it gets stale way faster than any bread I've ever seen before. Even after only leaving the bread out for a few hours, the outside starts to get stale and crunchy. I should be an ASMR channel. 
That's good for Ponco, but that's bad for bread. I have a few ideas for how I can work around these issues and make something really delicious and cool, but that's going to take some time to set up. So subscribe if you want to see what comes next. If you want crustless bread, it's super easy. All you have to do is use any bread recipe, pull off a tennis ball sized blob of dough, and steam it for 15 minutes. It's bao. People have been making this for 2000 years. It's great. You can consider using a traditional bao recipe. It's super delicious. Or if you want a crustless PB and J sandwich, you can use a recipe for sandwich bread. I've linked one below. Since you made it to the end of this video, let me zap you some bread. One weekend in August, I will be hosting a meetup for my patrons. You can help assemble my mechanical marble computer if you want, and I'll bring this death trap for a live demonstration followed by a tasting. It's just $2. If you're in the Seattle area or can get there easily, it's kind of a ridiculous deal. If you're curious, in the description I have a link to a free post on my Patreon account that discusses all the details. Thanks for watching, and especially thanks to these absolute freaks who supported me after I released a single video.